My name is Gretchen Spletzer, and um, I'm on the committee for the Global Green Burial Alliance. Um, I'm a death doula and a future funeral director. I'm in school right now and um, provider of green burials in El Dorado County and Sacramento County. And um, former administrative coordinator for the Green Burial Council. So <clears throat> me and um, the committee's members for the Global Green Burial Alliance, um, we started the Alliance and want to have monthly forums and this is our first one. So the name of the forum is Green Burial um, Growth, Obstacles and the Future. Uh, I'm referring to my paper here. Um, just to go over a couple things, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box and I will, I may um, use them throughout the panel discussion, but I also will look at them at the end. So if your question doesn't get answered in the middle, we'll get to them at the end, um, just to kind of keep things moving on. This is also recorded. And so if you could mute yourself so that we don't have any static in the background, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> so, First of all, I'm going to have Ed Bixby, um, our founder, do a little introduction about who the Global Green Burial Alliance is, who we are, and talk about our vision and uh, about the network. So, Ed, if you want to do that, that would be great. Thanks, Gretchen. Hi, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, Destination Destiny Memorials. Eagle Warriors Funeral Supplies and Steelman Town Cemetery Company. Uh, many of you may know me for my involvement with the Green Burial Council. Uh, I was a part of that organization for 15 years and president for 10. Uh, you know, during my time in this movement, you know, I realized that it was critical to create a safe environment for all things in green death care. Conversation, ed you know, education, acceptance of others culturally and religiously are key components to better understanding and growth. Uh, this vision gave birth to a concept of a new organization open to all, not only in North America, but globally. Two years ago, it became obvious to me that the growth we had experienced started to slow, not because people didn't want it, but because we needed unification among the movement itself. Uh, to promote the positive acceptance and growth to reach loftier heights. So in the earlier 2023, I decided the time was now to create a social networking space that served the public, the industry and the world, a pledge organization that did not need to certify nor police, but rather encourage positive discussion and education to all free of any monetary obligation, a place to call your own, whether you prefer natural burial or natural organic reduction or acclimation, a place of knowledge and understanding. The concept was presented to some of the most accepting forward thinking pioneers of the green funeral movement. And the challenge of creating this space was accepted with, with open arms. The GGBA was born. Now we serve the committee and myself offer a safe space to explore and grow. Please accept my sincerest thank you for your presence today. The game changes for all at this point forward. Whether you are a cemeterian, a funeral director, a grief counselor, a death doula, admirer or an activist. Your presence is appreciated and there's a place for you at our table to help create positive change in the green death care movement. I hope you enjoyed today's forum and I encourage you to take the consumer or provider pledge and become one with the GGBA. <clears throat> so without further ado, I'd like to move forward, Gretchen. We can't hear you. Sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> I usually don't mute myself, but um, <laughs> so yeah, um, it would be great if you guys signed the pledge and networked with us and tell your friends um, because we hope to create a network where providers can find resources among each other and consumers can find everything they need you know, the full gamut because there's so much out there now. So I encourage you to go check out our website. Um, 
So one of the things when um, the committee of the Global Grain Burial Alliance uh, got together, one of the things we wanted to do was have these forums and also um, talk about or spotlight people who are doing, you know, really good things within the green funeral industry or um, promoting green burials or starting cemeteries or anything like that. So our guest, our spotlight person tonight is Cleopatra Hughes, and I'm going to introduce her right, right after I introduce um, the people who are on the panel tonight talking with us about green burial. So on our panel tonight, we have um, Melissa Meadows, who's a dual licensed funeral professional, professional carrying active licenses in Washington, Oregon, and Texas. Online, she's the modern mortician. Her goal is education on all options at the end of life, providing a unique insight into funeral service industry with over 20 years of observation and participate, participation. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Melissa is the original founder of the, the End Founda Foundation, a not-for-profit that provides education and support for those seeking a more symbiotic relationship with death and dying. Melissa is almost always shadowed by her sidekick, Kermit the dog, which you probably all have seen on social media. Um, and Melissa and Kermit have served their communities together for six years and present often to nonprofit organizations and educators across the world, both in person and online. And then we have Elizabeth Fournier, she began her career in 1990 in Portland, Oregon, where she was employed as a live-in night keeper, sleeping in a trailer in Portland Cemetery. Three years later, she is a one-woman funeral service in the rural town of Boring, Oregon. Elizabeth owns and operates Cornerstone Funeral Service and is the author of the Green Burial Guidebook, everything you need to know to plan an affordable, environmentally friendly burial. You can wa watch Elizabeth's TED okay. Talks um, and more information on her work, The Last Act of Environmental Volunteerism. Sorry, I got that a little mixed up. Then we have uh, Steve Burkoff and Laura Bones. Uh, Steve and Laura are the founders of Memorial Reefs International and Pet Reefs memorial service companies that build artificial reefs containing cremated remains to restore co coral reefs and marine life worldwide. These memorial reefs honor loved ones with a permanent resting place and living legacy and produces life for centuries. Pet Reefs recently built the first official reef dedicated exclusively to pets. Steve and, his fam Steve and his family run organization are dedicated to helping heal the oceans and embrace all efforts to bring greener alternatives to death care. We have some real powerhouses in the green burial movement. So these bios are lengthy because they've been doing a lot of good work. So, <laughs> then we have Bob Ferdick. Ferdick Funeral Homes is a full service funeral provider located in Malika Hill, New Jersey. 2008, Bob began offering green burials and home funerals. Bob and his wife, Denise, have assisted many families with green burial. Together, they have gained a wealth of knowledge as well as an abiding reverence and passion for natural burial methods. In Bob's words, it's been an awesome experience and a sacred trust that families have chosen me to facilitate green burial for their loved ones to help them create a profound memorial. Not only is it beneficial to our uh, planet, it's uniquely healing experience for us. And then we have Walt Patrick. Walt Patrick is the senior steward of Herland Forest 501C13 nonprofit educational cemetery in central, South Central Washington State. Herland is doing innovative work in enhanced natural burial and using the interment of human remains to protect and enhance forest land and providing interment for the morbidly obese in developing innovative natural burial options for couples and in 
Oh, I can't read that because my ink is so faint. Sorry about that, Walt. Um, individuals who choose to rely on Washington State death and dignity options. So he serves also people who uh, have that choose the right to die. Okay, so let's see. Our spotlight tonight is Cleopatra Hughes. And she is the founder of the Alabama Green Burial Association. She's a funeral uh, apprentice, uh, funeral apprentice funeral director in Millbrook, Alabama, and in the process of creating eternal garden sanctuaries. So, Cleopatra, I'll turn it over to you and tell us about uh, your project and what you're doing. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, I want to start off by introducing myself. So I am Cleopatra Hughes. I am a recent graduate from Jefferson State Community College in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I am also, of course, yes, an apprentice funeral director, and I have been passionate about funeral profession for about probably a little bit over Um, and I have been studying green forms of disposition for about four years independently. Um, our biggest goal for the AGBA is to educate our community as well as other funeral homes and funeral directors in the area about green burials and other natural forms of disposition, uh, while also still making sure that they all stay in compliance with Alabama state laws. It is very vital in our area to know that they do have another option for earth and that will preserve our state's land and ecosystems. Um, the AGBA will be holding a first Q&A event for the community. That way everybody can ask questions and get further information as well as join in on the green burial movement. The event is still a work in progress, and I will be keeping everybody up to date about that. As for the Eternal Garden Sanctuary, our goal is to be open here in the state of Alabama by the end of 2025. Um, and the biggest goal overall for Eternal Garden Sanctuary is that we want to conjoin the values of life and death and also attempt to remove some of the negative stigma surrounding death and death care. Thank you. Oh, that's great, Cleopatra. Um, yes, I've talked to Cleopatra a couple times when I was working for the Green Burial Council, and uh, that's one of the things that the Global Green Burial Alliance wants to do is, uh, you know, use the knowledge that we have in our committee to help people start cemeteries if they need you know, some advice or they're looking for information to contact us. So um, Cleopatra has her links in the in the chat if you want to support her project. Um, I think she's going to be the first green burial cemetery in Alabama, or there might be one other one. But do you know Cleopatra? I can't remember. You told me. There is an, another location in Alabama, um, but as far as the First, I will be the first that is certified and has been through classes and training. That's great. That's great. Because I know there's not much in Alabama. Um, you know, people write the info box looking and there's not much there. So we need that. So getting into tonight's uh, discussion panel, we're going to talk about, I'm going to just open with um, the growth of the movement. So, um, just on statistics, the interest level in green burials, according to AARP in 2007, was 42%. In 2022, the NFDA reported that it's at 60%. And while I was doing a little more current research, um, it's up to 63% already. So um, in, in some polls, and it's even higher depending on what group you're polling. Um, and then I've also found in my research that between 2022 and 2030, the global green burial funeral market is forecast to grow by 8.7% over 
according to emergent research on green burials. This was published in June of 22. So we can see that it's growing pretty fast, especially in the last few years. I know my time at the GBC, um, I saw, I was there three years, I saw a lot of growth and lots of people interested in finding themselves a green burial for themselves or family or wanting to get into doing something, either starting a cemetery or uh, making products or just getting into the world of green burial. Because as we know, usually you're quite passionate about it when you're interested in it. So, um, so yeah, I was, was going to ask uh, Elizabeth, I'll start with you. So from when you started, how's growth going for you? Like, what do you see um, in boring Oregon? <laughs> Sounds funny. So fortunately, it's a national thing and there's interest all over the place. And luckily, I happen to be in a state, the fantastic state of Oregon that really, really embraces all things natural from recycling to recycling our humans and going green that way by burying them. So, you know, Portland has a lot of cemeteries. I can just even start with that. We have nine cemeteries in the area that allow green burial. And that's pretty phenomenal. And that's pretty amazing that there's so many choices. My first green burial was almost 20 years ago. And that was when it was still something that people didn't think they could do something legal, but they wanted to do something, but they didn't quite have the information. And now it's really in the zeitgeist. You see this in all the newspapers. You see this in a lot of periodicals. We're doing this in television shows. And people are really embracing the fact you can do this. It is legal in all 50 states. You just have to figure out where you want to do it, how you want to do it, what you want to make it look like. And there's many providers. You can tell by all the people on this call, all the interest out there. So many people are embracing this and want to help you get it to happen for yourself. A lot of resources out there. Yeah, that's great. And also um, just kind of an, another, it's, it's a little different, but how things how awareness is growing is with um, Steve Burkoff and Laura Bohm's Memorial Reefs. Um, you know, it's grown from just serving people to now they're um, helping the, the, what do I call it? The veterinarian uh, death world, right? Steve and Laura, you guys are, did that um, pet Memorial Reef in off the coast of Florida, I believe. Yes, we, um, in January, uh, launched our first uh, <clears throat> uh, pet reef in, uh, off the coast of Sarasota, and um, we were able to um, inter uh, oh, remains of uh, approximately 20,000 pets in that um, one reef. We've since um, sent down um, an additional approximately 20,000 in uh, June, and we'll do another 20,000 in uh, and um, we've also sent um, some of the, um, we've deployed um, reef balls in Mexico as well that included the remains of uh, uh, pets, probably another 40,000 there just this year. Yeah, we've, so. We've also, we've also just opened a factory in uh, New Jersey, just down the road from Ed, um, where we'll be processing almost three times that amount on a quarterly basis and uh, add to our reef that already exists um, off the uh, coast of Ocean City. So it's a, it's a huge market and it gives people an opportunity to really uh, bring meaning to their pets passing. And they're helping the environment in a big way. Yeah, yeah because a lot of life um, gets created in those reef balls. So even though cremation is not a green burial, what you can do with the cremains can really help for years and years and years to come. Yeah. Centuries, yes. You know, the reef balls are supposed to last hundreds of years. So that, that's what they're designed for is to become part of the seabed and uh, grow fish and coral and everything. Um, yeah. It's pretty uh, remarkable how much we've seen just in six, in oh, six yeah, between the first two mm -hmm. deployments, how much growth was on in and around the uh, memorial oh, that we had placed. Uh, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and I just a little tidbit on that. I just, you know, my mind kind of goes, well, all the coral reefs are dying. But I just saw a thing that the scientists are actually genetically engineering coral to withstand warmer temperatures. So that problem will obviously well, somehow well. get negated by that. You know, if the oceans continue They're to like warm. introducing different people. I just decide it's more substrate for um, coral to grow and also no. for uh, more fish to have a longer life since they can be sheltered as juveniles and have a chance to grow up. Yeah. So, so we're seeing a lot of growth um, in, in the green burial world. There's different options now, a lot of different options. And um, one of the things I wanna bring up that's really important is the hybrid cemetery as well, because we have them in most communities and not all of them are offering green burial. Um, I have here in the United States, we have 350 hybrid, or 350 cemeteries offering green burial. And there's other ones that aren't reported, um, you know, a few out there. I know that, I know that there's other ones in, pro you know, in like conservation ones and stuff that are in process, but um, as far as cemeteries goes, Ed, with the, with the growth in your, you know, serving families with green burial, what do you see? I know you have a lot of stuff going on at Parisima. So, so, I mean, the growth really lies, the low hanging fruit is the hybrid model because every community, you know, has a cemetery and there is no rules and regulations, you know, within the 50 states that prohibit natural burial or the use of vaults. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, everyone can have this option. And for a variety of reasons, it's important to have it, you know, whether it be financial or whether or not be spiritual, but, uh, you know, environmental, but it can, you know, it can happen and it can happen very easily because in these spaces, there is no permission needed other than permission from the cemetery itself. So, you know, we could say there are 350 natural burial cemeteries, but if there are 25,000 or 50,000 cemeteries in the United States alone, we have the potential to have 50,000 natural burial grounds. So the hybrid is most certainly the most important one of all. I mean, conservation and, and, and uh, natural certainly are very important, but I think the growth uh, and the education starts in the hybrid. Yeah, I, I really like hybrid cemeteries myself because of the history that they contain and the possibilities that can be done in them because they already exist. Absolutely. So, one of the things that we can all do is connect with our local cemeteries and get them on board with this. Um, and if you can't do it, get more people to to keep asking them because eventually, you know, they need to stay in business. And if people are wanting to give them business in the way of green burial, they they might change. And a lot of them do. And once uh, once they do, a lot of them find they're doing great business because I know I did a forum with the GBC and we found, you know, there was one in Utah that soon, I think its whole green burial section is, was sold out in a couple of years from pre-planners. Pre so that's really good. So, you know, some of the obstacles though about this is one, as we just talked about getting those cemeteries on board um, to do green burials and um, getting people to ask their cemeteries. So it always does boil down to education and, um, you know, educating the community about their options and maybe not waiting till the last minute when they're already dead <laughs> and then their family has to do it for them. So, you know, education, education, education. It's so important. So anybody who provides green burial services really should be, you know, sharing the good news on their social media, their their email list, um, offering to do presentations for their local Sierra clubs, uh, League of Republican Voter, you know, women's Republican voters, everyone, everyone should know. And um, believe me, they're super interested once you get talking about it. They're not, you know, most people don't want to bring it up, but 
you get talking about it, they'll they'll listen. So um so yeah, the the obstacles of um bringing the hybrids on board um I guess probably people like Walt don't have that problem because he has such a lovely cemetery and people know to to see him when they want something uh, you know green in the in that way um and then there you know the other thing too that we're seeing is there is a lot of public awareness obviously it's it's grown but then we have states like Minnesota who just had the moratorium and that really you know that was a squabble among neighbors but the, the legislature also had no idea really any information about green burials their research um they probably really didn't even know how many were be, you know going on in their own state so um i think another obstacle is our own lawmakers not really knowing the law when it comes to green burial um ed do you want to speak to this a little bit since you're involved with loving earth and the minnesota issue or oh, absolutely i mean you know it's not just a, a an issue just for myself i mean you know certainly over the years we have faced this for the last 15 years you know helping and guiding people through these obstacles you know people are just typically people are afraid of the unknown if they don't understand something then you know they may be afraid of it so no matter what we do when it comes to any of these options, whether it be a memorial reef or natural organic reduction or aquamation, it's all about the transparency of the process and an understanding of that process itself. But you know, in Minnesota, what ended up happening was something that was perfectly legally zoned for a cemetery where like, you know, literally we had just had to come in with a plat. Uh, there was this hysteria created by people who didn't understand it. And instead of taking the time or wanting to learn what it was, uh, they chose uh, to, you know, make hysteria out of it and scare people and, and say that you know, animals would dig up bodies, it would contaminate groundwater. And, and none of these things happen. And, and, you know, logical people understand this, but even, even when you look into cemetery law itself, it's very clear and distinct as to what you can or cannot do. And natural burial is not prohibited. And the unfortunate part of uh, the circumstances in Minnesota was that these individuals had taken it to a state level and they had created this moratorium that, you know, don't forget about the cemetery that we have that should be open. Think about the religious uh, rights that were being denied by passing this moratorium to the Jewish and Muslim communities that practice this, you know, from the dawn of time and, and still do it today. So it's our job, you know, at the GGBA to educate people in a way that they understand these processes. We have the uh, experts who, who can walk them through and they can have a better understanding and be better equipped when they walk into these zoning offices or their local, whoever it may be, and, and sound, you know, at least give a logical uh, assessment, or I don't wanna use the word argument, but give them the straight uh, language that they're, they're going to need so that they can understand what we're doing is, is perfectly legal and has always been perfectly legal. So it's unfortunate, but it all starts with us. And, you know, uh, you can't back down. You have to stay strong and you have to follow the lead of people who can help lead you in the right direction. So again, anyone on this call, you know, uh, it's one of those things that, you know, quite certainly you will probably find some opposition if you're looking to do some of these things. But I really can't so much say get, that you could get angry with the people. It's just a matter that they don't truly understand what the law is. So it's our job to educate them about it, so. Yeah, um, it was somebody in the audience, Denise, um, had a suggestion of, could be interesting to present at the Chamber of Commerce meetings and Rotary Clubs and groups like that, you know, even your city council for that matter, you know, do a little green burial presentation so that our lawmakers aren't completely lost when it comes to, to you know, the research on green burial because Minnesota will do their research on green burial and they'll find what we all already know that there's no harm to the water table. Animals don't dig bodies up and, and uh, 
as the other founder of Loving Earth said, it's one of the most gentle things that you can do with the earth, which is a green burial. So, um, so another, um, uh, so I, I'm going to probably move back and forth between obstacles in the future because I wanted to also bring up, because I want to loop um, Melissa in to this conversation a little bit and switch up to aquamation because I saw that there was some um, questions about that. So I just want to state before that water cremation, aquamation is um, legal in 18 states. And there's a, an additional seven more states that it's in the process of becoming legal. And so aquamation is a, a newer thing for us humans. It was used for veterinarians for a lot of years, my understanding. Um, so Melissa, what do you see as far as aquamation in, in your funeral directing world? Um, generally, I see awareness of and location become more prevalent. Um, I think this is a in creation. Once we get all the old fights out of the way to legalized and everything. You're breaking up. Breaking up. Okay. All right, guys. All right. Is that working better? Much better. Thank you. Okay, so um, the thing with the water cremation legalization, I think it's going to outpace flame cremation as the communities and individuals become more aware of it outside of just what they know they know. Um, we've got three big companies out there that are producing these machines. Melissa, um, you're still pretty, pretty broken up. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. But, uh, actually, Nikki is on the call. I don't know if she can hear us, but she actually works with resignation. She may be able to throw a word in. Nikki? I can throw a word in. Yeah, go for it, Nikki. Here, I'll turn on my camera. Oh, let me, let me get the kitchen light behind me. Just a second here. I was out mowing Thanks the lawn and then I came in when I realized what time it was. So I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, Melissa, if your connection is better, feel free to jump in. But um, I'm the sales manager for Resumation America in um, North and South America. And so we manufacture um, equipment for alkaline hydrolysis. So um, our count, Gretchen, is actually 27 states that are legal right now. Oh, that's um, great. Which is fantastic. I know um, there's varied information across the internet um, and what you see. Some states have yet to write their rules and regulations. So while it's legal, they can't actually practice yet. Um, but of the legal states, only 15 have um, practitioners. So mm. there's definitely room for growth. But we're seeing... Um, I just got back from the NFDA conference and it's nice to see more and more funeral directors. When I first started um, almost five years ago, we had a lot of funeral directors asking, um, what is it? You know, they weren't familiar with it at all. And now we're really seeing funeral directors start to ask, how can I get it? So. Mm -hmm. That's good. Um, I just want to say, I'm always you know, I'm just a regular person and I see stuff online. So I'm yeah. just going to say this, but I was reading, there was a big controversy because people were saying, oh, water cremation, they're, they're actually just sending your remains down the drain into the sewer. But then I also heard that the argument against that is that when you get embalmed, they send all that stuff right down in the drain into the sewer. So it's, I, the, you know, I don't know. I just think that it's all dissolved anyways. So you're just getting the essence of the body, right? Well, so after the process for alkaline hydrolysis, the body is all broken down into its, you know, basic elements. So what that effluent consists of is um, amino acids, peptides, sugar, and soap. 
So, right. the, you know, it's saponified. So when it goes down the drain, it actually is soapy, right? It, we've had some water authorities said that they've noticed a difference, like that it's cleaning um, yeah. and there's zero DNA. It's a hundred percent sterile. You know, we've tested, um, but your point is exactly right, Gretchen. What, yeah. what funeral homes are sending down the drain is far worse than anything <laughs> that, that these processes are. But yeah. That's, but that's not what people imagine in their minds, right? They're picturing horrible right. things. And people forget about what happens in embalming because it's so accepted. Yeah. And I only bring it up because I think, you know, when we're talking about obstacles, these misconceptions of things are, you know, it's good to have the answers for people when they come up or right. something to come back with about and it one to make thing them think. We, um, we like to share with people too, is that when, when you bury a body directly in the ground, I mean, so this is perfect topic with green burial, but the way the body will naturally decompose over time with bacteria, that's alkaline hydrolysis. All right. we've done is sped it up inside of the, um, inside of the machine. Yeah. And then the only difference is little bugs are eating all of the stuff in the earth is filtering the fluids and all of that. And it actually happens fast. I had it a dead squirrel I pulled out of my pool and like within an hour, the ants were all over it. So I have to bury that after this uh, meeting. So um, let's talk about natural organic reduction because we have Walt here, which is great because he's a real expert on it. Um, let's see, where do I have the statistics for NOR? We have, oh, hopefully my statistics, Statistics are right. We have uh, seven states have legalized and um, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine states that are considering natural organic reduction. So, Walt, what do you see? I mean, this looks like it's really growing. There's a lot of interest in it. Um, I remember talking to you at one point, you said the phone was ringing off the wall just from people wanting to like learn about the process and the get into, get into the business of it. This was a while ago. I don't know if you remember, but. Yeah. Well, yeah, we get lots, lots of calls from people who uh, looking, looking to get in on the gold rush, uh, a new opportunity. Uh, mm. Yeah, uh, this, yeah, there's some challenges. I mean, people I think that are that are coming into this with just a looking for an income option. Uh, I, I, yeah, I try to convey to them that this is a calling. Uh, this whole area of working with death care, mm -hmm. and it's not a, a quick way to to get money. Uh, and yeah, there's some there's some uh, real challenges. In, in the financial dimensions of mm -hmm. opening up a new area of disposition uh, here in the Pacific Northwest, because we're we're at 80% uh, uh, cremation and the estimates are we're going to 90% uh, by the end of this decade. And so mm -hmm. fitting into that is all a real challenge. Yeah, so in your cemetery, you do you do um, tree of life like, scattering around a tree or mixing it with compost or um do you offer that oh yeah we we offer a, a range of situations depending upon where somebody wants to end up these are just vehicles to get uh the body and the spirit to where it wants to be uh, yeah. so if if somebody has uh cremains then we'll go ahead and help them uh, neutralize them uh, and then uh, bury them uh, in what we call a tree grave uh, with uh, compost and wood chips and a whole series of things to help the tree get underway and get going. So if, if you want just a standard tree, uh, <clears throat> i.e. we're in a forest that has pine and fir and oak, uh, then you know the forest actively wants to reclaim that grave. But if somebody wants something different, uh, an apple tree or a, a plum tree or just a whole variety. We've got all kinds of stuff. A, a quaking aspen, this seems to be doing really well. Then oh. then it's a little bit more to 
help that tree because that tree is not native to our ecology. So, you know, they can they can go there if you give them some help. And so helping to go through that. So, yeah. It's all a matter yeah, of what vision the family has and how can we help them uh, help make that transition from life to death to life. Yeah, I think it's fascinating how um, how much interest there is in natural organic reduction. How long in your uh, vessel does it take for the body to break down? Well, we do. We we take the natural uh, part very seriously, and so it it is much quicker in the summer and it's much slower in the winter. Yeah, uh, and so that's fine. But you're you're talking about about three months is about average. Oh. I would have thought it was longer. Well, it, it is. It is depending on how the, the temperature. What, well, what also what endpoint? Because uh, our situation, we're doing it in a. So you have the first phase that deals with the fleshy parts of the body, and then you have the late the next part that deals with the bones and and the various other components there, and then to round it up uh, to get it properly homogenized and properly pasteurized all of those states, and then finally certified because uh, samples have to go off to a state-sponsored laboratory to confirm that it is um, the E. coli uh, components are gone. Uh, and so it, there's just a number of steps involved in it that take time. Uh, but we, you know, we try and convey to people that uh, these decedents are going to be dead for a long time and that it makes sense in my mind just to give it peace and give it uh, time and let it naturally go forward instead of aggressively uh, speeding these things up into an industrial process. Uh, yeah. We, we want to do it in the forest and let it go naturally. Yeah. I like that. I don't, I don't think, um, you know, there's other methods of speeding it up other than letting it go naturally. Um, you know, they, pulverize and stuff like that and I, I don't know that a lot of families know that 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 happens but um so well thanks for explaining that and i uh walt has a website and does a lot of stuff up there and I encourage everybody to check it out because he's got a great place great thing going on up there so um so let's go just to straight up green burials now. Um, let's see. So I said earlier, 60% of the population would be interested in exploring green burials. And we have, what did I say? 350 in the States. I think there's, um, what were my global statistics? We have 39 in Canada that I found, um, 270 in the UK, 20 in New Zealand, uh, three that we know of in Mexico, and then uh, Slovakia, Ireland, Hong Kong has some kind of government initiative going on. Um, and then there's a lot of interest around the world in doing this. So that's really good news. That's touching upon our global growth. And um, then just, uh, I, I wanna ask Bob and Elizabeth, cause you guys are both funeral directors, you know, about the future. Like we know families want more hands-on and they that's part of the reason why they pick green burial. Um, and so, I know there's the old standard way of uh, doing funerals, you know, that we all probably been to for our relatives and all of that. But I know that there's a lot of um, funeral directors that are doing new things. Like there's a Keith Funeral Home where they actually have a room that they let people, the family come in and do the bathing ritual, you know, with the bowls and the music and the oils and they just guide the family through that hands-on process. Do you see um, funeral homes in the future providing services like that or being more willing to go into the home if the family wants to, you know, have it in the parlor, like we used to say, that, you know, 
we used to have our funerals in the funeral in our home parlor. So what do you guys think? What do you see the future funerals looking like as we go forward with this? Either one of you. Everyone first? Yeah, go for it. Well, ladies first, if she would like to speak. But, um, so we've done, and definitely education is the key. Uh, and that tends to be a little bit difficult because people have their preconceptions and their, um, regarding like vaults and bombing. I'm surprised at how many people still think that that is state law or it's the law that they have to be embalmed if they're being buried or they need the vault. They have to have the vault. So educating them on that. Um, as far as home funerals, we've we've done a few recently, but they've been embalmed bodies. The family requested that they be embalmed, but we did take the casket into the home and um, they had their viewings there. I have had a couple of people come and help dress for either green burial or a normal burial. Um, so I, I think the future again is education. I get a lot of calls about green burial. People see it on my site or they've heard it or referrals or whatever. One of the things I see as an obstacle is they don't realize, like they, cremation is on the rise. There's no doubt about it. And I think most pushing that mostly is economics. Um, and I've had many calls from people looking into green burial that they're surprised that it's not equivalent to a cremation. It's, it's more money. It costs more money to be buried in the ground, but they, for some reason, think it should be cheaper and closer to what a cost of a cremation would be. When I explain to them the reasons why it's more money, they, they sort of understand it. At the present time, I'm, I'm taking more phone calls and pre-arrangements than we're doing actual burials. Six months ago, we were doing burials, I would say at least one a month. Now I'm in the Northeast. Um, so that may have something to do with, as opposed to California or Oregon or the West Coast. So again, it comes down to educating people. Um, we are doing pre-arrangements, but for some reason, the, the actual burials have kind of leveled off or, or we haven't had one in, a, in, in several months. So um, I still think it's the future though. Because the people that I'm talking to are younger people. They're not um, older people in their 70s or 80s who would normally come in and prearrange their funeral so their family doesn't have to worry about it. Um, so a couple things I would like to touch on though is if they're, I don't think, I don't know if people realize like if you're in a state that does not have a green burial, a cemetery or even a hybrid. Most airlines will transport an unembalmed body. Now, with, with this COVID stuff starting again, I don't know if that'll change, but we've, we've, we've flown bodies in from other states and I've sent bodies out. The other thing is, you know, most funeral homes, I would hope, who were in to the natural burials, the green burials, would be willing to say somebody's in North Carolina to travel down there in a car and pick the body up and bring it back. You just need to have ice packs and things like that to keep the body preserved for the trip. So, um, and again, this goes to education. Like people need to know that these things are possible. Um, so I'm, I'm optimistic about the future. I think the obstacles that are there, we can overcome. But again, it's education, 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 education. So, okay, thank you.
and it's a pleasure to be on this and an honor. I appreciate it. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, it is so much about education. And I can see some of the comments in the chat. Somebody just said, you know, talking to our seniors, but also young people are really interested in sustainability and doing something. And I, I just love, and we're creating one right now, a green burial planner. I, I love green burial planners because it's just something you can stick in your file and at least your family has a clue, you know? And if you have a business uh, in the death world, you should have a green burial planner to give to all your people, all your clients. It's right. just such an easy thing to give people an idea what you want. Um, you can do it by yourself. So <clears throat> how about you, Elizabeth? I know I did a forum with you on um, natural green burial funerals, which was great. I remember um, you actually mentioning using berry juice on the lips, which uh, I loved. So I know there's so many things that you can do. Yeah, I can't say enough about it. It's a thrilling topic. And I'll tell you what, in Oregon, green is the new black. There are all the choices, all the things you can do. And all the interest too, which is fantastic. Our national cemetery allows natural burial. You wanna know why? Because people kept asking for it. You ask and you shall receive. Consumers wanted it. We kept calling them up and saying, okay, is this something we can do? We've got somebody who wants this. Now they've opened the door because people kept kicking at it and knocking it down. It's just a matter of asking all those pioneer cemeteries, giving them a call and saying, hey, what do you think about having a burial there without a grave liner? Can we do that? They're thrilled someone's even coming and buying a grave. If you want to save money, something that you can do actually in 44 states is you can have a burial in your yard. And it's an amazing high number. People aren't aware of that. In Oregon, where I am in my county, people can have home burial. You talk about probably the lowest cost possible, die at home, have somebody prepare the space in the yard, carry yourself outside, put yourself in the ground. I mean, isn't that amazing? It's beautiful. It's perfect, spiritual, it's everything. And it's economical, cheaper than cremation. So that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. It, so there. I was just going to say it is legal to do that in most of the states. People don't know that. I have a map of it. There's only like four states or three states that you can't, I think. Yeah, let me address that because I think that's something that's very interesting to people. So Hawaii is a hard no. You can't do this whatsoever. And the state of Washington, which is pretty open because they have NOR and all of that, they just had a House bill pass. It was House Bill 1037 back in May that says, yes, we're becoming open now. And what, you know, people did have private land burial there. But what they're allowing you to do is to, if you had a homestead, if you had uh a grave space before that wasn't a registered cemetery. So we're moving that along and that pretty soon will be private land burial. But again, everything has to go through the legislature, as you know, but the only states that say there are some barriers, there is Arkansas, California, Indiana, and Louisiana. And those four say, you know, if you happen to have, again, a rural, rural area, you happen to have family already buried in a family plot, will possibly be open to it. But again, you have to always call your county zoning and planning or whatever it is in your area and always ask those questions. Even though I happen to be in a state that says, sure, you can have private land burial or home burial or backyard burial. It's not open all over the place. It just depends on where you are. And then you have to make the calls. You have to even double check because even if it's rural, even if you have enough property, things come up such as, are you a renter? That's a big no-no. And even you have to think about it, you can actually own technically the property, but are you paying a mortgage? Oops, that doesn't really make you the full property owner. You don't technically fully own it. You really can't bury somebody in your yard. So there are rules for a reason. Mm -hmm. And people are just shocked to know there's lots of options. And getting back to what Gretchen was saying about berries, a lot of the makeup that I do is natural. And it's with just the... Uh, the fruits that just grow on the vines outside my parlor. So there's so much, the green world is so untapped. We can mm -hmm. do burials at sea. The full body can be buried at sea and you don't have to be in the military. So there's tons of choices. Ask, call your local provider. If they say we don't do any of this, 
hang up the phone and call another provider. There's somebody out there who'll be able to give you all the information you need. And it's all over the interwebs. It's pretty magical that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I have love, a quick, I, I have a quick oh, comment yeah. because I live in Hawaii and I have a friend who was buried on his property in Maui and uh, and uh, uh, Elizabeth said it was a big no. So I don't know why he was allowed to do that, but I'm I know. I'm thrilled that you he, said that because Washington was also no for a really long time and someone had a private island and they were able to do it. So oh. that's primarily the, the, the across the board. Yes. But we have found people who've been able to make it happen. So always ask the question, always check in. There are rules, there's laws, but you know, it's amazing how people have worked around them in legal ways because there's some loopholes sometimes about maybe something being grandfathered in or somebody already had a berry there or they've already found it to mm -hmm. be safely ground. Well, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Bodie B was involved and he probably knew how to work around it because of his funeral home. And anyway, mm -hmm. thank yeah, you. Also, uh, one of my close friends had a natural burial on Maui as well. So I'm not sure how that uh, was sent through actually. So that's interesting. There must be something. But I'm glad to hear this too, because yeah. this is actually really good coming up. Because even though I'm somebody who does green burial and is really into it and have written a book, you know what? We're all learning. Rules change and it's all a conversation, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. all education. It's mm -hmm. all a conversation. None of us have all the answers. So we really need to reach out to others. So I'm really glad you both said that because I'm going to do more research now too. So I have all of the correct information. And if it's not a hard no, if it's a soft no, I want to be able to know why it's a soft no. Yeah. And I'm going to call, I'm going to email Bodie B and find out because I, I'm acquainted with him. So I would love right. to hear what he's doing over there and get updated because it is all changing. It, we're in a big moment of change with this right now. Um, and I just want to say like uh, Elizabeth's um, forum that I did with her for the GBC was so inspiring because I, I see for the future just, you know, instead of the funeral director being such a bummer to call. I mean, of course it's going to be sad times, but with, with the green burial, we can make this our own. You know, I like to call it bringing back our own death ritual. You know, the funeral directors, like the art director, they'll give you the ideas, you know, to pick your own flowers or to use a special piece of fabric that you want to use for a shroud or, or that you can use berries for the lips yeah. and, just um, feel more, uh, you know, because I'm going to get spiritual on you. You got to feel more to live more. So um, that's, it's just so important as we all know. And um, I'm just really excited about it. And I think all of us here probably are. So I'm going to see, let's yeah, see. Yeah. Odie again. And but one of the things he's doing is he's created a fund so that he can provide free burial services for the victims of the Maui fire. And mm. ultimately, he wants to provide free burial and funeral services for homeless and veterans on Maui. So oh, that's great. Yeah, I remember. That yeah, that's so good because I, I tried to recruit a couple cemeteries. Um, mm. I, was it on Maui? I think it was on Maui. And I didn't get any emails back. I was trying to get them interested in going green, but so that's nice. I mean, I, I just can't see how cemeteries can really ignore not jumping on this because, you know, for too much longer, I just think, I think in another few years, it's going to be a normal, regular option. So Gretchen, can I say something? Sure. Yeah. So um, I, my name is Ruben. Ruben. I'm from San Francisco Bay Area. I hang out with Ed Bixby. <laughs> <laughs> now, I love everything what everyone is saying. Um, uh, I think that we need to kind of focus on the green burial being in, in a cemetery because at the end of the day, in the death care industry, we have lobbyists who are fighting against a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do. Um, and as a funeral director, if we start taking the funeral director out of the equation, then it becomes an issue. I'm playing devil's advocate here because 
I hear a lot of things about home home burials. That's cool, but then it goes back to what happens to the cemeteries. And, you know, people talk about their jobs and everything else. Um, you know, I just did three pre-needs last month for Green Burial, uh, thanks to Ed and, you know, working with Ed and what have you. And it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's all about education, as a, a lot of people have shared with us. Um, but also promoting on our website and advertising, getting the word out, because, you know, if you search uh, on Google, Green Burial, uh, coma cremation will pop up. Um, we do roughly, I don't know, maybe 90% is green for us. We don't use chemicals and bombing unless the body has come from the coroner's office and the family wants a viewing, different situations, basically. But uh, I just wanted to you know, put my two cents in there. Uh, I love the ideal. I mean, you know, I've been working with Ed for the last couple of years here. Um, and we get a lot more people asking about that. You know, how does it work? What have you? Um, and again, it does start with education, but at the same time, I just want to make sure that the funeral directors must be part of that equation, everything. Um, I know people are going to disagree with me on this, but I just have to share my 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 point of view on this. Thank you. Yes. If, well, I, could I... Say if I could say something in yeah. addition to that, because, you know, the perfect scenario is grandma dies in her bed. And we take her, family takes her, prepares her, buries her, if they're able to do it on their own. But not everybody passes away that way. So I think the, <clears throat> the funeral director is imperative, in, especially like an accident or something where there are issues with the body that the, the average person is not going to be able to handle. And... The, pre the presentation of a green burial. If we're not embalming the body, we we have we don't we don't have as much control over preparing the body for a green you know a, a situation as somebody who is just trying to do it on their own, and that can really put a black eye on the green burial. Even unfortunately, if a funeral director isn't really up to the knowledge of what it takes to take somebody who's possibly been in an accident or has had a, had, had cancer for a long time and is really in a bad way, that we can, we can handle that and present that, make that presentation more comforting to the family than somebody that is really not in tune with what they're doing and, and doesn't have the knowledge of how to handle a situation like that. And that's important because uh, say they put somebody in a shroud improperly, not 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 taking care of certain issues that they may have they sh should have addressed, and then at the cemetery something happens. So we we I think we need to be aware of that, and I agree with Ruben that the funeral director is a very important part of this, and especially if they're knowledgeable, they need to be knowledgeable in how to handle situations without chemically preserving a body. So. Yeah, I like, um, I think of it as the future of a funeral guide. Like, you know, I mean, it's directing and guiding a family through that process and then taking care of the things that the family can't or doesn't want to, you know? And I mean, a lot of us don't, touch on death you know very often so the things that funeral directors know the average person doesn't know how to deal with and, and that's also why we need them because they know how to handle things in that way and of course you know death doulas too have their part so it's just important that families have options and and can find what they need and what they want one one more thing I'll say, and then I'll be quiet. I'd like to refer to the green burial as beautifully simplistic, because there's there's not all the marketing. You know, the, you can have a casket if you want. You can be shrouded if the family wants. Um, but we're not we're not 
pushing merchandise. Like, you know, we're gonna have a whole wall full of caskets. We're gonna have a wall full of vaults or, or a brochure full of vaults. If they want memorial items, that's fine. Oftentimes they'll make their own um, cards and programs and things like that. Um, so that's, that's and, and, and then once, once the service is done, the burial is done, it's just to most people there in attendance and the family, it's just a beautiful, simple way to lay somebody to rest. So. Yeah, it's so very true. Well, yeah, everybody, we are getting down to, um, thank you, Bob, for um, and everybody for talking about all of this because it's very exciting and I hope that we'll be all talking more. Um, I was just, I think we've pretty much addressed all of the questions. I will look through this uh, at, after the meeting and if there's any questions we missed, um, I will answer it in an email. But um, I'm, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Um, if there's anything any last minute questions you want to unmute yourself and ask, you're welcome to now. Uh, I want to say that we're we're going to try to do these forums every month. Um, we want to do one on uh, products, you know, funeral products, memorial reefs, um, community involvement in the cemeteries. I have a whole list of things that the committee, we want to do forums on. So check our, our uh, social media platforms and see what's coming next. We're on TikTok, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I think that's it, so. We have a YouTube channel too, correct, Gretchen? Yeah, YouTube channel. And this, um, this forum, all our forums will be uploaded on that YouTube channel. And, you know, probably within a few days from today, hopefully. Is there any, if I could say one thing to the group before we, before we finish up, you know, just so everyone knows, you know, the beautiful thing about what we're trying to do is unite everyone across all fields, you know, whether or not you're a grief counselor or a death doula, no one is right or wrong here. Everyone has their own personal preferences and we want to be able to assist them in the best way possible that we can. Uh, this is about a movement that's changing uh, our funeral industry culturally uh, but it's important to understand, you know, that this is actually a win-win for everyone involved, the funeral industry, the consumer, the environment, and how often does that happen? So uh, I do myself appreciate everyone and all the committee members for supporting this. Uh, we're only going to grow from here. Please encourage your friends to take the pledge. You know, it, it costs nothing. You'll, you know, you'll be able to uh, reach out to us resource-wise. Uh, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, if you have any questions, if, you know, it can be directed to myself, to Bob, to Elizabeth, to Ruben, to any of the people that are on our committee, because we're not here because we're trying to advance ourselves. We're trying to advance the movement, and that's critical to the growth. So I just wanted to say that I, you know, thank you very much and encourage others that you know uh, to support the GGBA, and uh, we will help support you. I, I wanted to add in just a quick statement. Um, that I, I believe all effort, everything that we're doing is positive. It's not a matter of having to do everything green every time. Uh, I think any effort that you can bring to each service uh, to make it even a little bit greener is going to help us all. So I just, so be green every day and let's make it work. Well, let's do uh, Gretchen, if I may, um, before we all pack up, I just want to say um, thanks to everybody uh, for being here and uh, really respectfully to Ed and his vision um, of seeing things in a, a greater, bigger picture on a global scale and the support of you, Gretchen and Elizabeth um, behind Ed uh, coming across. Um, and what I wanted to is just share, it's really wonderful to see people all like-minded there's no self-interest here there's no oh we don't need the funeral director we do need the funeral director uh we do need supplies and and somebody just said i forget who it was just a moment ago i beg yours um 
we can't be all things to everyone. We just give people options, you know, and that's a wonderful place to be. And it doesn't matter if you get wrapped in toilet paper and put in the ground. If that's what you want to do, go and do it. But it's the education, I believe, to our seniors. And as Gretchen pointed out in the comment there, even the youngsters this day and age, to plant the seed. Um, there's so much of this myth out there that you have to do this, you have to do that. And I did drop a comment there, if I may. I've been around this game 25, 30 years. When I first attended Cana, I saw a grown man, a funeral director, take some information regarding flame cremation. No, no one even knew how to spell acclimation in those days. And he dropped it on the ground and stomped on it publicly at the Cana convention. Everyone watching, looking. That's how much the funeral directors fought against change. And it's still out there, you know, to some degree. It's great to see people like Ruben and Bob, um, you know, able to look at it differently and serve the client. The, just give the client what they want. doesn't matter what it is. Let them do what they want rather than keep this closed shop and people assuming they've got to be embalmed. And, you know, that, that, that furphy, I, I introduced acclimation to somebody here in Australia, uh, a very high respected independent uh, uh, funeral director, um, well respected, and his first comment was, "Oh, great, going to pour grandma down the drain," which is what you said earlier, Gretchen. So it's a little bit like when I was in the swimming pool industry many years ago. You got people fighting fiberglass versus concrete. And it's the same thing now with cremation. You know, your flame versus aqua, um, uh, all sorts of myths and things. So I just see this body, the G. Uh, GGBA with Ed's direction, thank you, just calling it as it is for everyone. It's an open shop. doesn't matter who you are. You could come across from the GBC and join and be here, I'm sure. Ed wouldn't even mind. We don't care. Who? We, this, it's not a closed shop. This, I believe, will be a wonderful resource for consumers and educate folks, even funeral directors. We're all here in harmony and peace. It's just another option. Do as you wish. That's all I just wanted to share. I just see wonderful change coming, and I'm delighted to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So, uh, yeah, so everybody, thanks so much for coming. Um, I will be, I'm one of the admins for the Facebook page, um, and so I'll be seeing you in cyberspace and um, come over and sign the pledge. Send us any resources you think we should be aware of internationally um, organizations, because we are gonna create a resource page on our website. You know, I wanna know about all the, um, the things that are out there. I want, we wanna share this with everyone. So um, I hope uh, you guys all have a great evening and thank you for, for being here. Appreciate it.